Okay, let's listen to it. It's a intro in E flat, and Peter Bernstein plays it during a concert with the Emmett Cohen trio. So it's Emmett's place, one of the most famous jazz things on YouTube. And they play a beautiful standard called My Ideal. And then Peter Bernstein plays this short but great intro. Let's listen to it. We'll listen to it twice. Beautiful, right? Let's listen to it one more time. That's great stuff. It's typical Peter Bernstein stuff. I did more intros. There's another intro like this. Um, I think it's in my Patreon. Yeah, it's in my Patreon. And there's so much more uh, intros of Peter Bernstein I could do, but I, I really like this one. And yeah, it's, he plays this uh, in front of the tune My Ideal. And the chords that he's using in this intro are reminiscent of that tune, but you could easily use it in front of any tune even a swing tune. So let me get the tap. So it's completely free. I played it also freely and Peter Bernstein plays it freely. You can be fast in some parts and slow in other parts. I just played it like Peter Bernstein, but if you play it yourself, you can take any tempo you want. First, let's look at the chords because the chords are interesting. Um, there's lots of chords here. Of course, he plays even more like voicings. I put the basics, like the, the skeleton there, but we can even reduce it, and then we can see that's actually pretty easy chord progression. It's basically E flat. And now let's skip that second bar, and it goes to G7. Let's skip that A flat, D flat to C7, to F7. And then it's B flat 7, so it's a dominant chain, right? E, e flat, C7, F7, D flat 7. It's a dominant chain, going back to the one chords. And then E flat seven to A flat, that's the four chords. And then it's another dominant chain, G seven, C seven, F seven, B flat, E flat. And it's always the case when you look at intros in jazz, especially when it's a tonal player like Peter Bernstein is not a crazy outside player. Those chord progressions are super simple. And that is because chord progressions in jazz are super simple. There's this misunderstanding that people think that jazz has complicated chord progressions, but that is actually not true because we can only choose basically from two five ones, turnarounds, dominant chains and crystal changes. Um, is there anything more, anything else? Yeah, well, there's this minor cliche, right? The... There's that thing. And there's maybe that. But that's it. How many is that? Like eight things? Eight things. You're limited to those to those chord progressions. If you if you go away from any of those progressions, you're getting a really weird tune that people probably wouldn't like soloing over because we're all practicing to play good lines over those chord progressions. So when we look at this intro, it's just dominant chain. It's all dominant chain. There's one uh, five one to the four chord, and then it's a dominant chain again. So what makes jazz harmonically interesting, it's not so much the chord progressions, but it's the voicings and uh, the way you navigate the chords with extensions and stuff like that. But if we look at like chord progressions in classical music or even bluegrass sometimes has more interesting or more variety in the chord progressions. Well, I know bluegrass, of course, is also very similar, but there's more happening with like weird bars. 
like two four bars and um, surprising things. It might sound strange, but it is the case. And those music styles need it because they are not using the really nice voicings. Yeah, death metal probably as well. Yeah, pop music. Like if you look at Sting or John Mayer, those chord progressions are way more interesting. But they need it in that music because they're not using the extensions or the, the weird voicings as much. So then the interest in harmony comes from the chord progression itself. But in jazz, if you would have those very complicated chord progressions, then it would not be possible anymore to have all these nice extensions and voicings because it would, it would distract too much. In jazz, basically, we always need the bass note in the roots, right? not so much inversions. We don't really like that in jazz. Because as soon as we put an inversion there, we cannot really put extensions and the voicings get limited. And uh, we need it to be one of those eight progressions. Otherwise, <laughs> we're lost. Funny, right? Not, not a lot of people know that. Even jazz musicians themselves often have the idea that they're playing harmonically complex music, which is not the case. <laughs> if it would be, it would be very difficult to improvise on, on jazz. And it is not, well, it is difficult in a sense, but it's not difficult because of the chords. It's difficult because of the timing and the complexity in the lines themselves. Let's start from the beginning. We get this beautiful voicing for E flat major seven. And then Peter Bernstein plays some single note line. So here, here's the first thing that we need to take care of. You can see those slurs. The slurs don't mean that you have to um, put hammer-ons, something like that, but it means that you have to kind of keep the notes ringing. You want to hear those notes together, and you want to hear those notes together. Why? Because this is a D half diminished chord, right? You see? So to get that sound, we have to take care of ringing notes. So from the beginning, and it's a, there's a fermata on top of that E flat major 7, means you have time. You don't have to play rhythmically. You can play that chord, wait, let go of it, and then start playing the single note eighth note and also free you don't have to play it as eighth notes you can time it yeah and then we slide from this d to this voicing of a flat seven sharp 11. the d is a sharp 11. that's a typical voicing that peter bernstein uses all the time he plays it like this without the thumb but i'm used to playing it with the thumb i think it's easier it's also the way that stochlo for instance would play it so he plays A flat 7 to G7. Now, harmonically, it moves from E flat to G7. But uh, as a passing chord to G7, he plays A flat 7. So you get E flat 7, A flat 7 to G7. And then before the A flat 7, he plays D half diminished, which is a two chord for G7, right? But instead of doing immediately D half diminished to G7, there's a passing chord at A flat 7. Is the tap not correct for the A flat 7? It is not correct. You're right. I moved the tap to the wrong strings. I will, I will fix that. You're right. That sometimes happens because I, I can read tap fine, but I hate writing tap. So I write notes because I'm a violin player and I hear the notes. So I always write down the notes and then I let the computer generate the tap, and then the only thing I have to do is move the tap to the correct strings. I do that very fast, and sometimes I make a mistake. So here I moved <laughs> that chord to the wrong <laughs> to the wrong strings. You're right. It's, it's supposed to be on the, the D, G, and B string. Same as the next forcing. Uh, good eye, Guillaume. Okay, from the beginning. Peter Bernstein plays that G7 short, so he plays. And I think that's a nice effect, so we let's keep that. Now we get this great voicing. That's an open string voicing, at least there's one open string, the B. And the nice thing is we get this small second interval. But sounds extra great because of the open string. And then he plays something melodical. All right now, let's say we would be in a different key. We would be in the key of um, D. Then we cannot play this forcing. But then you just play. Uh, I would suggest you play this. 
play this voicing, right? Uh, that would be um, also A flat minor or D flat sus. Also works. So in the key of D, you could just play that. But when we're in the key of E flat and you have to can play an A flat minor, this voicing is a recommendation. I've seen it before uh, with Peter Bernstein. Uh, when it's D flat seven or A flat minor, he just plays this voicing. So this is a voicing. Could be many things. That this voicing could be an A7 octatonic. Might you play that uh, half note whole tone scale? But because it's octatonic, and with the octatonic scale, all the dominants are equal, we can shift the um, voicing three frets. And you could. You can use that on the four dominants of that scale. I won't go too deep, but this voicing can fit over A7, but can also fit over C7, E flat 7, and uh, G flat 7. In this case, it's C7, and he makes it very clear by playing. We have a C7 flat 9. Uh, okay, let's do that again. Now, if you play this, be, be as free as you want. You don't even have to play the exact way the chords are broken down. Right? You could also just play. Right? You don't have to play. You can do anything you want. Let's. I'm gonna play it again, and I'm going to be very free. Right? Something like that. Let's go on. We get this another typical Peter Bernstein forcing for F7. It's this forcing. It's another sharp 11 forcing. Peter Bernstein loves sharp 11. Very dark sound. If you want to play this forcing high, you get something like this. So you know this forcing maybe as like a B7 forcing, but it's also F7 sharp 11. So this forcing would be 6. Seven, seven, eight, seven. Very difficult to play, you will see. You can use this particular voicing for C minor, B7 and F7. And the low variant of this voicing is this one. A good voicing to learn. Nobody is using that, basically. I, I've only seen Peter Bernstein use it, so. And he plays this counterpoint. It's funny because I would expect that lower voice to keep going down because he plays. And then all of a sudden he goes to. If that lower voice would go down, you'd probably get something like. Something like that. You could also do that. You can play that, that voice going down. Or you play what Peter Bernstein plays, and he plays. Also good, of course. Or or with the with the real counterpoint. I think maybe that's even nicer with the with the counterpoint. So we end on the D. He goes to this voicing for F7, which is also not used a lot. It would be the same as this, but on the middle strings, people don't really use that, and um, it's beautiful. And then we get this voicing for B flat sus. Now, this part is actually the, the most tr uh, difficult part where we have to play. Peter Bernstein plays those chords very fast, um, but if I play that fast, I make a mistake. So my strategy would be to play and now we take my time for the first two chords. Because this forcing, this F minor 7 forcing low on the guitar, it's just, it's just tricky to make sound clean. So I would do... And then play the next chords a little bit faster. We get um, G diminished or D flat diminished. Then we get this really beautiful forcing for B7. That would be B7, right? B7 flat 9? Is it that no, it's not flat nine. No, not flat nine. It's nine. Then I get B flat sus to B flat 
flat 9 13. So you see all those, uh, the, the progression is very easy because it's basically just F minor, F minor 7, B flat 7. But what makes it beautiful is all these luscious voicings with the flat 9 and the 13. So let me play it from the counterpoint. I think this is the hardest part. I had to practice that the most to get all those chords clean. Why not take just more time? Ah, that's beautiful. I arpeggiated some chords, took some more time. Maybe that's even nicer. Let's play from the beginning until here. And now we get something that is more in time, because here Peter Bernstein wants to go to the tune. He wants to um, suggest the tempo. So this is, it's still free, but it's a little bit more rhythmically, so. Beautiful uh, chords. The progression is, is very easy, right? It's E flat, E flat seven, A flat, D flat seven, that's basically what the chords are. You maybe recognize that progression from a tune like There Will Never Be Another You. It's literally in that tune. But with these chords. You would not say it's that progression. It's, the chords are so mysterious. They have a really a dark color. It's the, the chord progression sounds way more advanced. Especially this chord. It's a D flat sus. D flat sus 13. Let's play it again. And now we get something that is also difficult. This is, has to be in time. Very difficult because you're supposed to have that G on top ringing for as long as you can, but it's, it's very easy to mute that note and then you lose some of the effect. Let me play it very slowly. It should sound like this. So you should keep that high G should sound. So what you have to do is keep your finger down, but you have to also play something complicated. It's not easy to do that. And then even more difficult here. Okay, let's say you managed to do that. I'm even not good at it, but the rhythm is very important as well, especially of that F7, B flat seven bar. So if I sing from the bar before, we would get three, four, ta, da, di, di, three, four, tika, di, tam, pam. So that, that, that F7 bar, that you want to have that chord on the second 16th. Let me play it from the E flat six. So still kind of free. But now tempo. Nah. See, I don't manage to keep that note ringing, the top note. Peter Bernstein does that very beautifully. And it also looks very easy for him. I guess he played that particular progression on many times. Also, maybe it's easy on the art stop. I don't know. Now that B flat seven chord he's playing here, it's like B flat seven flat nine. There's no thirds, but you could play any B flat seven there you want. Maybe you could do or do like Django would also be nice. And then you can play a ballad, right? Uh, 
Peter Bernstein goes to E flat as the one of the song. But you could also play a swing tune after this. Maybe you could do, um, so you play this part. And then you just. Why not? Just make something up that goes to a certain tempo. Let me play the whole thing, if I can. It's not difficult except for those last three bars that, that can mess up the whole thing. <clears throat> Just practice very slowly. You have to, to keep that G ringing. You have to also not hit it again with your right hand. So you have to... Yeah. I also, I'm muting, I see I'm muting that high F with my pinky. Maybe there's someone in the chat that can do that better than me. I find it very difficult. Ah. Also, maybe it's this guitar, but to have a bar on the first fret of this guitar, or maybe any Gypsy's guitar, it's just very hard. Okay, let me play the whole thing. I played a B, B major 7 uh, before going to E flat. You could do that, right? But uh, I think the rest of the intro was pretty good. And you can play it in many keys, right? You don't only play it in E flat. No questions? Uh, dream of you. Oh, yeah. Dream of you. Yes. In E. Yeah, you can play it in front of Dream of you. Let's try it in E from here. From. Um, this intro for a swing tune is very easy just play E with the G sharp in the bass uh, flat 3 diminished so G diminished and then go to F minor and they go back and then one more time and then 5 so you get 3 4 great works in, works great for Dream of You well would work great for any tune ballad or swing tune Basically, any intro that's for a ballad, you can make a, uh, an intro for a swing tune by just ending on the five chord and then play this swing intro or any other swing intro. Okay, cool. 